All right, so we are continuing the discussion on shear design of reinforced concrete. Uh, we'll continue this module six. And now in this uh, part of the video, we are going to uh, talk about uh, what are the IS-456 provisions for shear design. And then we will also uh, discuss some design examples. All right, so we are following this IS-456 provisions for shear. And you know that IS-456-2000 is the code of practice for uh, plain and reinforced concrete design in India. And uh, so the expected learning outcomes from this uh, part of the video is students should be able to identify the critical sections for shear for the design of RC members and should be explained what is nominal shear stress and how to calculate nominal shear stress for beams with varying depth. Uh, you may encounter a situation where the depth would be varying and then uh, uh, how to consider that and then the code provisions that exist in IS-456 for design of shear. Right. So first let's uh, talk about uh, the critical sections for shear. Right. So before we do that, I think structural analysis is very important. We need to uh, accurately should be able to uh, uh, calculate the variations of bending moment and shear post tag right, for an element. Once we do that, now, what is the section that we need to take uh, for design? Now, for demand, uh, the code says it three scenarios that the code is saying. For the case one, uh, let's say for if you have uniformly distributed load, but then you can take critical section where you calculate your shear demand VU. Okay, VU can be at a distance D from the face of the support. So, this is your face of the support, though your column, for example, here. The, the beam is resting on some kind of a pedestal or kind of a bearing. So you can see the distance is basically from D from the face of the support. Okay, so that is the critical section where you are supposed to calculate your shear demand that you are going to use in your uh, design. Right. However, uh, if you are having a heavy load, within a distance of D from the face of the column where you are having some heavy load, some point load, for some reasons it is coming. In that case, you have to consider the section only at the face of the uh, uh, support, not at a distance D from the face of the support. You have to consider critical section at the face of the support. For example, you have scenario two things. Okay, In this left side, you have a heavy load. Right side, you have uniformly distributed load. So right side for shear demand, you can take at a distance of D from the phase of the support. Okay, But however, because you are having a heavy load that is within the distance of two, two, time, two times the effective depth from the phase of the column, you have to consider the critical shear section as the phase of the support. So you are going to overestimate the little bit uh, conservatively estimate the shear demand okay now you can ask me why is it the code is asking you to calculate the shear demand at a distance d from the face of the support not at the face of the support for usual scenario right so there is going to be an axial thrust that is going to be coming from the support that is not going to allow the crack to form here it is always the crack will form at a distance away from here like this so it will not crack will not form because there is an axial thrust that is going to limit the crack formation in this region. It is going to push the crack away at a distance of a d by 2 or so. So that is a, that is the reason the code is saying that you can, uh, you know, anyway the crack is not going to form there. Uh, so you can take a distance of d for your estimation of your shear demand. So it is considering the beneficial effect of your axial thrust that is coming from your support. Okay. But we cannot consider this beneficial effort if you have a heavy load that is coming within the distance 2D from the uh, uh, face of the column. Then you have to calculate your shear demand only at the face of the support. Right. So this is also another scenario. When you have a suspender beams like this, again, like this kind of a cantilever kind of suspension that is there, then in that case also your shear demand has to be taken at the face of the support like this okay not at a distance beam from the the support okay so when beams are getting hanged from another element again you will not have this beneficial effect so you have to take at a distance of 
phase of the, the support for shared demand calculations. So this is very important uh, provision that we need to consider. Now, we talked about how to calculate the shear stress, right? So T tau for elastic case is going to be VQ by IB. But we know that reinforced concrete is neither elastic nor plastic. It is inelastic. And we are also going to have a lot of reinforcement, longitudinal bar stirrups. And then, uh, uh, so you're going to have some kind of redistribution of stresses. The code is saying that, okay, don't worry about what is the exact shear distribution. You calculate nominal shear stress in an average sense. If you know the shear demand, you divide by breadth and depth of your depth of your effective depth of your member, then you get your nominal shear stress. Okay. Now, code also recognizes that if you are having beams of varying depth, that means you are not having a constant cross section, you are having a varying cross section, then there is going to be an additional component where either it will amplify the shear or it is going to reduce the shear demand depending upon how the beam is varying uh, that the code is recognizing that as this vu plus or minus mu by d times tan beta by p that way we have to calculate so as your nominal shear source this is for uniform depth this is for varying depth now we will understand what happens why this additional component is coming when you have a, a beam of varying depth Okay, so usually we consider plus when your moment demand is increasing in the same direction as the effective depth is increasing. So, uh, so what does that mean? So, for example, if you look at it here, let's say that I have a beam like this. Okay, now what would be the bending moment diagram? So, if you look, if, so we know that the bending moment diagram is going to be like this with PL by 4, right? Now, for this beam, if I am so providing a cross section like this, which is less cross section for a simply supported case, and then it is going to vary like this. Okay, so here this is your beam depth. Okay, so wherever moment is higher, I am going to put more depth. So, or in other words, the depth is increasing in the direction of your bending moment. Okay. In that case, you are going to take negative sign, or in other words, the shear demand is going to be Pu minus Mu by D times tan beta. Now we will understand how this component comes in the next slide. But if your depth is increasing, in the direction of your bending moment, then the shear demand, this is your VU net, net shear. Okay, this is the one that we are going to use in our calculations. Okay, if D is increasing and uh, let's say if I put it this way, if D is increasing and moment is decreasing, then your shear demand will become VU plus MA by D into tan beta. So in this scenario, is exactly opposite. So, for example, for some reasons, if my beam depth, if you're not providing this way, I'm providing the opposite way. Opposite way is what? Basically, I'm having more depth here, more depth here, and due to some reasons, okay. So, and then I am providing like this, okay, a varying cross section. Then you can see here. Now, this is my beam depth, okay, for some reasons, okay. So, in that case, your depth is increasing wherever the bending moment is decreasing, in the direction where the bending moment is decreasing. So, uh, sometimes we will have these kind of scenarios in some structural elements, which we will talk about. So, in that case, your net shear has to be increased. So, that is what we are going to have. Now, what is the... Um, uh, let me read this. Okay. So, MU will become bending moment at the section and beta is basically angle between the top and bottom edges of the beam. So, for example, let's say bottom and top edge. So, what is the angle? So, let's say you have like this scenario. Your beta is basically this. Your beta. Okay. So, top and bottom edges of the beam. Okay. 
Now let us see how this thing is going. So for example, I am taking a uh, how to adjust the shear demand. Okay, and uh, for example, in this case, let's say I am taking a, a beam where the bending moment is going like this, and then it is going like this. And shear force diagram is also like this because some load is coming here, so it is going to come down. Okay, shear force diagram is this. Now you see here, if I take this uh, case, the first case. I am considering depth is increasing now. If I am taking a section here at a distance, let's say at a distance of x, my bending moment is mu and shear is vu. And then if I look at the free body, if I am providing a beam cross section like this, where with the depth like this, and then it is increasing. So you can see that bending moment is increasing in this direction. My depth is also increasing. So d is also increasing. So this is the same direction. In that case, if you look at for this particular uh, scenario, if you look at the free body diagram, now you are having bending moment of mu that has to be resisted by internal forces. The internal forces, concrete contribution will come from Cu and your tension force. Now what you like, you have a beam of varying depth. So your reinforcement is going to follow the depth so that you can maximize the tension force, right? So it is going to be not straight, it is going to be at an angle. So now this moment couple is going to be given by this Tu to resist because uh, for the applied moment, right? Then your component of this along the bar is basically going to be Tu by tan beta. Now this vertical component is going to be Tu tan beta. So if this angle is all beta, and if your uh, diagonal component is Tu by tan beta, your vertical component is going to be Tu tan beta. Now you see here, this is an additional vertical component force that is there. Now, if you look at for vertical force equilibrium, shear demand Vu should be equal to, if I call this as Tu tan beta, so basically it is going to be now acting down, right? So it's going to be Vu net plus Tu tan beta, right? So we are interested in calculating what is the net shear that is acting at the cross section where we are designing. So Vu net will become Vu minus Tu tan beta. Okay, so this is from your sigma Fy equal to zero. So vertical force equilibrium, right? Now, how is this? This is the tension force. We know that teams are usually provided reinforcements in the order of one one and a half two percentage you know if your demand is less or even even when you go for double reinforced section we are ensuring that you are going to have tension bars are going to be yielding okay that is what we discussed in your own curvature analysis and your flexural design right so if you see here the neutral axis depth at ultimate if you are providing less reinforcement the neutral axis depth at ultimate is going to be very small right so what we can say here is then how is the moment resistance is going to come? We know that it is going to be tension force multiplied by lever. If my lever arm, uh, this is I need to find what is the value for lever arm. Okay. So if we, if we know this cross section, right? Let's say I have some steel here, right? What we are saying is we know from your force diagram. Let's say this is your strain distribution that what I have. Let's say this is epsilon C equal to 0 0.003 pi. That what we did. So your neutral axis depth that is required to satisfy equilibrium will be usually very low at ultimate, right? So we have found. So then when you calculate your CC force, concrete force in compression, and then tension force in steel, we find that this distance is going to be. 0.42 xu as per your is code, right? So this is going to be xu itself is very small. So this 0.42 xu will be even less. So you can say that this distance is actually d, and this is your lever arm, and the lever arm is going to be nearly equal to that of your effective depth for a under reinforced section. And when your reinforcement levels are limited, this is an approximation that we are making. So the lever arm will be nearly equal to that of your effective depth. So that is the reason. Now, how to calculate my tension force? I know the moment. What is it? So lever arm is 
now I have equated that to the effective depth. So what is tension force? Tension force is mu divided by effective depth. So that is what we have taken here, where compression force should be equal to tension force, which is mu by z, which is approximated to mu by d because we are dealing with an under reinforced section because code permits us to design only an under reinforced section. So we want to make sure the steel is going to yield. So when steel is yielding both for singly reinforced as well as doubly reinforced section, your neutral axis depth is going to be very small. So your lever arm will be very close to that of your effective depth. So if you substitute that, then your net shear is going to be Vu minus Me by D times tan beta. Okay. So if my depth of the beam is increasing in the direction of my bending moment, there is a vertical component that is going to reduce the shear demand and that value is going to be basically uh, mu by d tan beta. Okay, you can also have, so for example in footings you can have this situation and uh, uh, there are many other situations you may encounter this situation. But if your depth is reducing in the direction of bending moment increase, which is also not, not correct because we want to maximize the lever but for some reasons if you end up that kind of a situation then you have to account for that increase in your shear demand okay so that is what we are going to see in the next case so let me erase this All right, so let's look at the next case. So again, same. Now, if you see here, if you look at the free body diagram of the uh, next case, I am saying that my net shear is like this, and compression force is like this, and then you have this, and then you know the tension force is going to be like this. Now, you will have a component, this vertical component, same Tu by tan beta will have a vertical component, which is Tu tan beta. Now that is acting opposite direction okay because the force is going up so the vertical component is going to be upward not downward so then again if you look at your sigma of y equal to zero then you will have basically net shear let's say this is vu okay so vu will be equal to acting up will be equal to vu net minus tu tan beta okay so our vu net will become vu plus Tu tan beta again Tu can be calculated as or approximated as mu by d. So this scenario again we have to take into consideration when your depth is reducing in the direction bending moment is increasing. When you have this kind of a scenario, your shear demand has to be increased by a value mu by d into tan beta. Okay. Right. Now uh, let's say that. Uh, we have looked at uh, the behavior of uh, shear, right? Uh, you know, from more circle for a generalized stress state, we can convert them into principal uh, generalized stress state can be converted into principal compression and tension. And then principal tension, if it is less than tensile strength of the concrete, then it's not going to have crack. But uh, usually, if concrete is weak in, you know, generally concrete is weak in tension, so you will exceed the tensile strength, you will have some cracks. And reinforced concrete, uh, you are allowed to have crack, only what we are making sure that the crack widths are limited by putting enough amount of reinforcement. Now, if you see here, the code is giving you tau c value, which is the shear strength of concrete. Again, tau c or vc is lumped as three things that we talked about in the previous set. vc is it, which is uncracked concrete contribution, vertical component of your aggregate interlock, plus the double action. See, all these three things are lumped together and given as a simplified expression as a tau c or your vc. When tau c is multiplied by b and d, you get your shear capacity, concrete capacity, which is vc. Now let us look at this. Uh, you can see here what we are having is 100 as by bd, which is nothing but your pt, okay, percentage of tension steel. And uh, the table is given with increase in concrete grade, okay. And then when your percentage of steel is increasing, let's see for two scenarios. Let's take M20. For M20, as you can see, for a percentage steel of 0.15, very low percentage, your tau C is 
when the percentage of steel becomes 3 percentage then it becomes 0.82 right so 0.28 has increased so you can see that for a particular grid of concrete the more and more steel that i'm providing i am going to have higher higher tau c okay why is it again if i if i put at ultimate if i put more steel what will happen your neutral from flexure point of view neutral axis depth is also going to be larger and uh, your uh, potential shear strength is also going to increase with increase in your percentage of your steel right so this as is basically the area of the longitudinal tension reinforcement which continues at least one effective depth beyond the section where you are doing calculations and at support uh, the where the full area of tension may be used provided the detailing we have to make sure that the detailing of this tension steel or the steel is properly anchored as per the provisions given here in 26.22 and 26.23 then only you can take the entire area of steel if the steel is not anchored only the area of steel that is anchored has to be included in this calculation that's what it is shown here at the support section right so now let's look at it here for a particular uh, percentage of steel now you can see here that when the grade of concrete is increasing again tau c is increasing okay why is it because higher the grade of concrete higher will be the tensile strength and shear strength is always a function of your tensile strength so higher the concrete compressive strength higher is the shear strength so tau c is increased similarly for a particular grade higher the amount of tension steel higher your tau c the reason is again you are going to have again the percentage of steel also going to help you in giving more double resistance and you are also going to have end up with more uncracked concrete in compression so these are the two reasons why with increase in your steel your tau c is increasing but it's not like increasing all the time so you see here 0 0.28 to 0 0.72 0 0.81 it is increasing after that it is remaining more or less same so it's not like you put more and more tension steel you will keep on getting increasing tau c because there is a maximum limit to it right uh, the double action as well as for uncracked concrete contribution there's going to be a maximum limit that's what the code is recognizing because you may end up failing in other modes like uh, over reinforced or a compression control mode that is why the code is saying that the beneficial effect of increasing your tau c is uh, limited to certain value okay right so uh, these are the values that we are going to get now this is for beams okay so this is what we have if you look at it at 1.5 percentage of steel again you can see that uh, as the grade of concrete is increasing your tau c is increasing because predominantly because tensile strength of the concrete is also increased now again for a particular grade of concrete you can see here uh, as the percentage of steel is increasing you are again your tau c is increasing but up to a certain level after two percentage or so it remains the increase is not significant it's more or less plateaus okay because when you put a lot of steel on the tension side you may end up with other failure modes which code uh, doesn't want you to have now, uh, so this is the expression. So whatever the value that are given in the table is uh, can be expressed in this form of equation. As you can see, the square root of whenever you see square root of FCK, it is basically a some form of tensile strength of concrete, and shear strength is always linked to the tensile strength of concrete. So that is why here. So higher the grade of concrete, higher will be the shear strength, and then in addition to that, you also have a factor called beta which is function of your amount of your tension steel again beta is coming in both the uh, numerator and denominator but higher the amount of pt then you will have higher tau c like what we have in table. so the magnitude of uh, design shear strength concrete shear strength depends upon the grade of concrete and the percentage of tension steel so these are the two important parameters that are going to govern your concrete shear strength and average shear stress we know what is the shear force divided by the area of the cross section or it is nothing but your bd basically tau v nominal shear stress basically vu divided by b times d and in b we have to take breadth of the web let's say if you're doing a flanger section then the b you have to take web because web is the one that is going to 
uh, take predominantly the shear load. Now, this is for beams. Now, let's say for slabs, what happens? Okay, so slabs, the code is saying that um, for solid slab, the design shear strength, whatever that was discussed before, has to be multiplied by k. Now, what is the value of k? For example, if the slab is getting lesser depth, okay, as the depth of a slab is increasing, you see here the k factor is increasing. Okay, as the slab gets in, it gets thinner and thinner, and then your amplification in your shear strength is recognized. Now, why is that? As the depth is increasing, your transfer shear stress is actually going to reduce, and k factor is expected to increase. The so core recognizes this fact. In addition to that, for uh, also when the slab becomes thinner and thinner. In addition to the bending action, you are also going to get more of your transfer the load more through your membrane action. That is by stretching. So that is also one of the reasons the code is recognizing that when you provide thin slab, you are expected to have higher shear strength. That is why that K factor. When you are putting slab of less less than 150 mm or less, whatever tau C that you are calculating, you can multiply this by 1.3. That means I am getting 30 percentage higher shear strength when your thickness of a slab is Plus again, when your depth of the slab is 300 or more, the code is limiting k to 1. Okay, so uh, then your transverse shear stresses will increase and then you don't get that beneficial effect of your membrane action. In addition to that, again, the, share, the, the tau C that what you have discussed, it does not include any beneficial effects of your uh, axial compression. So the code also recognizes that whenever you have members subjected to bending, shear, and axial compression, and you can easily see that from two sheets of paper that you are having. Okay? So if you have these two sheets of paper, when you slide against each other, and when you hold it, you cannot slide this paper against each other. So the presence of axial compression is going to help in improving your shear strength. That can be explained from your Mohr circle also. When you have axial compression, basically Mohr circle will shift more towards compression side. Or in other words, your principal tensile stresses will be reduced for a constant value of shear. Okay, so the presence of axial compression, that is what we do it in pre stress also. When you put element under pre stress, it takes more load for it to crack in tension. So the code recognizes this. The code is saying that okay, whenever you have axial compression, that I have to uh, include that effect, beneficial effect, in the form of some simple equation where it is saying that you can increase that tau c by a factor called delta which is 1 plus 3 pu by a g f c k or 1.5 whichever is less so let's say i get 1.6 here and here it's 1.5 then the delta has to be limited to 1.5 okay or if i'm taking let's say this is 1.3 and this is 1.5 then i have to use only 1.3 now pu is axial compression and a g is your gross area and f c k is your characteristic compression strength of concrete Okay, right. There is also another reason uh, the code is saying your shear stress, the tau b, the nominal shear stress can never be more than tau c max. The reason is again uh, the shear, the element with a generalized stress state, if you draw the Mohr circle, you will get principal compression and principal tension. Now we have said this sigma 1 can also reach your compressive strength f prime c if you are not careful. But most of the time, what will happen? The sigma 2, which is a principal tension, will reach your tensile strength. But it is not necessarily all the time true. If you are having a very thin member, and especially for a pre stress member with a lot of pre stress, you may end up with a situation that principal compress compression stress can reach the value of a compressive strength of concrete and it can lead to crushing. Or, in other words, if a shear demand is very high and if you are providing very less area then you may end up with a situation that your principal compressive stress may reach this uh, compressive strength of concrete and it can lead to crushing. The code is preventing us from designing such sections so that tau v can never be more than tau c max. If your nominal shear that what you are calculating if it is going to be greater than your maximum shear stress that is allowed for a particular grade of concrete then what we have to do is we have to increase the dimensions of the section so that tau v is always limited to tau c max.
Yeah. yeah. I'm in a class. Right. So, so you see the code is also giving different values for your tau C max as a function of your grid of concrete. Okay. So you can see here uh, for M30, I'm getting M3.5, M35, 3.7 and M40 and above it is limited to 4 megapascal. So tau V can never exceed tau C max that is given here. The reason is your principal compression stress cannot exceed compressive strength of concrete. In fact, we know that when concrete fails in compression, it's a very, very brittle mode of failure. And shear, when it is failing in shear compression, it is it's again a br very brittle mode. Shear itself is a brittle mode, even when it is failing in tension. Now, when the shear is failing in compression mode, it is even more brittle. It will not give you any warning. So the code is prohibiting you from designing such sections by making sure that tau v has to be always less than tau z. Okay. So this is what we have said. So this can lead to this kind of a scenario. Right. So now let's see what are the different types of reinforcement that we have. Uh, the code allows use of three types of uh, shear reinforcement. We can put vertical stirrups. Vertical stirrups are commonly used uh, because the direction of shear stress can change, especially when you have a lateral loads or wind load or earthquake load, the direction of shear stress can change. So uh, you cannot always put reinforcement perpendicular to the crack. So the practical thing is to put reinforcement vertically so that the crack uh, crack direction when it is changes also the vertical reinforcement is going to be very effective or if you are very sure of the uh, shear direction then you can also put inclined stirrups but it's not actually recommended only for gravity loads if you're not very sure if you're sure you can put but uh, the most common thing is to put vertical grips in the olden days people also used to do this bent up bars okay for example the sagging or the bottom reinforcement if it is no longer required, if you have a simply supported condition, for example, this can be bent up. But in, in, that's, you know, in the modern day construction, we don't really use this because it's going to take a lot of time to bend up. So what people do is basically they cut it and then they put uh, two uh, layers of steel. Right Now let's see for a cracked beam, what are the uh, contribution of your stirrup? Now, for example, let's say that you are estimating a shear demand and now we have estimated your shear capacity. If your VU is more than BC, that means the shear demand is higher than your concrete capacity in uh, the shear capacity, then what we have to do is whatever the difference is there. So, VU minus BC, that is an additional comp thing resistance I need to provide in the form of stirrups. Okay. So, this is your contribution for stirrup that whatever that they are providing should be higher than whatever the shear demand minus the concrete capacity in shear. So now concrete capacity in shear we can calculate from tau C, right? Now let's take a case uh, for a generic case uh, of an uh, inclined stirrup like this which are spaced at a distance of S, okay? Now I am assuming that with respect to horizontal these stirrups are making an angle alpha. And also, we know that in shear, you are going to have a 45 degree crack right at the middle. And if I assume this crack angle to be on an average sense 45 degree, right, then you can see that this is your effective uh, depth. Okay, this is your depth. So we can say that this crack, if I assume 45 degree, this distance is going to be basically D cot 45, which is equal to D. And then if I take this alpha and if it is this, let's say one stirrup is ending at the edge of this crack, then if I continue that until that stirrup, then this distance is going to be D cot alpha. Okay, this is because this is again D and this is alpha. So this distance is going to be D cot alpha. So the entire distance that is the stirrups which are within this distance of S1, that is D cot 45 plus D cot alpha will be will be intercepted by will be intercepted by this crack okay so now the stirrup is basically the shear is going to put the stirrup in tension now what would be the vertical component so now let's see how many stirrups are that getting crossed so if i know the spacing number of stirrups that are crossing the crack will be crack will be s1 by s now what is s1 basically it is d cot 45 plus cot alpha okay. 
divided by yes okay so that is this so this is the number of steps now what are the maximum pores that stirrup can offer 0.87 FY times its area that's the area of stirrups is asc and now this is stirrup is now at an angle alpha now what is that it is going to resist the vertical component of this tension force is going to resist the shear so the vertical component is basically 0.87 FY ASV times sin alpha. Now ASV stands for area of stirrup legs that are resisting shear. In fact, the shear crack will be a through crack. If I am having a crack, if I have multiple number of legs, all of them will resist the shear. So usually what we put is two leg or sometimes three leg and we can have multiple legs stirrups also. So when you have multiple number of legs, all of them will be resisting that crack. So, depending upon the number of legs that what we are having, ASV will be equal to two times area of your one stirrup. Okay. So, if I have three, then area of ASV will be area of one stirrup. AST, let's say stirrup. Right. So, this is a vertical component. So, this is the way we define. So, this is the maximum that when it is yielding is the maximum tension force it can take. That if I take vertical component sine alpha. And this will be the number of stirrups that are cutting that uh, number of stirrups that are cutting that crack. So in this way, we can find a generic expression for an inclined stirrup. Now, when I keep this alpha as 90 degree, then we know that sine alpha will become one. Then the stirrup contribution will become 0.87 FY ASV times d by s. This is nothing but your number of stirrups that are intercepted by this 45 degree crack. Okay. So, this is the way we can calculate your shear resistance from stirrup. And let me use this. So, so again, reiterating uh, stirrups will be required when your shear demand becomes more than concrete capacity. And that is the amount that we have to provide. And if you take this generic case, VUS will be TS sine alpha. The maximum tension force offered by the stirrup will be number of legs of the stirrups that are intercept multiplied by the tension force. Now this TS sine alpha I have to put. Okay, So this vertical component is only resistance shear. So if you simplify that, you end up with this VUS equation. Now, so what is the procedure for designing according to IS code? So we calculate your shear demand. The resistance that should be provided should be greater than your shear demand, just like what we did in flexion. Moment resistance has to be greater than your moment demand. And VUR is your nominal shear strength, and we use your backward shear force at the section. Now, how do we calculate your shear? It is summation of your concrete capacity plus capacity of the stirrup. Now, we see we know that we can write that as tau C times BD, and VS is we know that it is basically 0.87 FY times ASV times D by SV, right? So, this is basically your number of stirrups okay so in this way they can calculate the code also recognizes that if you see that vc has three components uncracked concrete aggregate interlock double action that all will be, will be activated only if your crack width is limited now to limit the crack width you have to make sure that you put some minimum reinforcement especially when your tau v the nominal shear stress becomes less than tau c Interval, the minimum shear reinforcement shall be provided. Though it is less than your concrete capacity, it's better to provide some nominal reinforcement. So that amount of nominal reinforcement is given as ASV by BSV should be greater than 0.4 by 0.87 FY. Okay, so now what is ASV? The total cross section area of stirrup flex. This is what I said. So if I am having, let's say, 10 mm stirrup and if I am putting two legs, Okay, so I have to multiply two times area of this 10 mm uh, uh, legs. Okay, so that is what we have to take. So area of let's say each leg. Okay. So uh, depending upon what diameter that you are going to put, each area of the leg you can calculate from pi by 4 d square, and then use that in your calculations. And uh, FY will be your characteristic. This is again another thing that we need to take into account. Though you may use 500 grade, in your calculations, the yield strength value that you are going to use in your shear capacity has to be limited to 
415 megapascal even if i am using 500 grid i have to limit it to 415 and I, again the reason is Paul wants to be conservative and make sure that you are providing a state of reinforcement at a closer spacing because from a seismic design point of view also providing closer types especially in the beam column joint regions is going to provide a lot of ductility similarly in the columns also the code recognizes that that's why code is making sure that you are not going to provide stirrups at a larger spacing so fy is actually limited to 415 megapascal now so we can have situations when tau v becomes more than tau c as calculated in table 9 we need to provide shear reinforcements either in the form of vertical stirrups or a bent up stirrup or inclined stirrup. One most common one is this. It is the common way we provide because stress reversals, stress reversals we don't know. Right? So when bent up bars are provided, their contribution towards shear resistance cannot be more than half that of what you get for your total shear reinforcement. So again, the bent up bar contribution is not going to be very efficient. So that is the reason code is limiting that to uh, half, not more than half that of your contribution from your total reinforcements. And now, what the stirrup uh, contribution should be? It should be basically V minus tau C into VD. And the VUS, we have already derived that for vertical stirrups, it is going to be 0.87 by ASV multiplied by D by SV. And for inclined stirrup, this is a generic formula. Okay, If you know the alpha of that st inclined stirrup, then you can plug in and you can calculate your shear contribution of your inclined stirrup uh, again so this is a uh, for single bar or a group of parallel bars bent up bars again this is the stirrup contributions uh, for uh, shear resistance okay so but this again said bent up bars are not commonly used uh, in the modern day construction so we don't really go for that <laughs> so <clears throat> So when more than one type of shear reinforcement is used to reinforce the same portion of the beam, the total shear resistance should be computed as sum of the resistance for various types. Let's say I'm putting bent up bar, I'm putting vertical stirrup, I'm putting inclined steps. You calculate each one of them individually and add all of them. So that is your total distance with the condition that, uh, right? So bent up bar's contributions cannot be more than 50% of the total contribution. So code is limiting you to use uh, also bent up con bent up bar contribution and minimum spacing again uh, spacing of the stirrups has to be uh, for vertical stirrups maximum spacing cannot move more than 0.75 times your effective depth and d for inclined stirrups at 45 degree or 300 mm so this on all the three whichever is smaller we have to use it as a maximum spacing so again why we put this maximum spacing requirement because inclined crack when you have an inclined crack forming still i should be able to generate resistance to aggregate interlock the double action and your uncracked concrete when your crack pit becomes wider then all these contributions will not be effective so only the stirrup will be uh, effective in resistance shear so uh, if you want to be a good design if you are putting closer stirrups then you can limit your crack width shear crack width then you can realize the all the other contributions Okay, so what is the procedure for design of uh, shear? Uh, first, we calculate your shear post diagram and uh, establish the critical section per shear. And then we calculate concrete capacity, which is your VC. And we also need to make sure that tau V has to be less than tau C max. This is to make sure that concrete doesn't fail in shear compression. Right, so we don't want to have concrete failing in shear compression. Again, when when you have a compression failure, it's going to be a very brittle mode of failure. You don't want that. So if this condition is not satisfied, the concrete dimensions has to be satisfied. Okay, right. So then, first for next step is to classify the shearing force on the beam. Let's say if your shear demand is only less than 50 percentage of concrete capacity. So then code is saying that everything is going to remain elastic. You don't really need shear reinforcement. But I would say it's a good practice to put some nominal stirrup, even if you if your a shear demand is less. Then we when your shear demand is between VC and point by VC, that means it has exceeded point by VC, but it is less than VC. Then code is saying that you provide minimum shear reinforcement as per this provision that we discussed, and also the spacing has to be less than this. Okay, 
now when shear demand becomes more than vc definitely we need uh, stirrups or vertical uh, stirrup reinforcements or shear reinforcement that we can calculate this uh, using this i think so this you know we use is basically difference between the shear demand and concrete capacity and then from the uh, formula that what we have discussed we can calculate your spacing of your stirrup and again most important thing is the maximum spacing has to be limited to 0.75 times the effective depth or 300 mm so the stirrup when you are putting for augmenting your shear capacity spacing has to be limited to either less than 0.7 times d or 300 mm whichever is lesser right so uh, if we summarize whatever that we have discussed in this part of the video we looked at what are the types of shear reinforcement what is a nominal shear and what are the critical section that we need to consider for shear and we also looked at when you have a beam of varying depth there are some additional components of shear that we have to include either it can reduce the shear demand or you can increase the shear demand that we have to appropriately consider and we discussed the is4 provisions for shear and also we discussed how to design uh, for a uh, particular shear demand right so uh, these are some of the references that we have used to, to uh, put this material together and thank you again uh, some of the, the slides were prepared by one of the phd student i would like to thank his help